Hey guys, Pastor Tim here. Hope you're ready for another video from our youth group at Lighthouse Baptist Church. If this is your first time watching a video or you're trying to catch up on a missed lesson, we hope that this video is a blessing to you and helps you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. picturing the church in three different pictures and how you can see whether or not a church you're part of or church you're searching for is a good quality church. Somebody tell me, what were the pictures that Paul used to describe the church we talked about the last few weeks? Josiah. There's the family. All right. And the field. All right. And I don't know that I remember. The last other week one. was the last one. Lock. Mission. What? The mission. No. Well, what do you mean by mission? Like the objective. No. Like Church. Yes, well, not the church, the building itself, or the <laughs> temple. All right, so we got the family, the field, and the building, or the temple. This week, we're going to talk about what makes, as you guys see in your notes there, what makes a minister. And he's going to use several pictures in this chapter as well. We're only going to cover one this evening, all right, what makes a minister. But do understand, as we go through this, when I'm talking about a minister, yes, I, I may be mostly referring to... Uh, like a pastor, you know, people like Paul, Apollos, Cephas, and so forth that we talked about through this series already, but it also can apply to anyone who ministers for the Lord, whether that be in church or unto other people, you want to be able to exhibit these same qualities as well. So each picture exhibits a quality that a minister should have. Now the church of Corinth had the problem of wanting to follow man. They're all about following people. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and people today have that same tendency as well. How do we see in today, um, in our society today, how do people have a tendency to want to follow other people? How is that most exhibited, Alana? How is it most exhibited in our society today that people like to follow people? All right, anyone on the second row? What do we have in our hands that show, Rebecca? Social media, because they're literally called what and what? Followers. Followers and influencers. All right, so it's all about, all right, if you're the influencer, what do you want to raise? You want to raise the amount of followers you have and the likes and hopefully sponsorships and whatever. But anyway, um, you eventually want to get to the point where you can tell people, hey, put here's my promo code and stuff like that. But that's not the goal of the church. That's not the goal of the minister. Therefore, Paul gives several pictures to show what a minister should be. Now, when we go through these in the next couple weeks, guys, uh, there's a couple things you want to be wary of, all right? Don't become hypercritical, okay? Well, oh, now I know that this is what a pastor should be or this is what a minister should be. What, you, you don't want to be hypercritical because you need to understand that everybody is human and humans, are they perfect? No. No, they're going to make mistakes, okay? So don't, don't try to see, don't be waiting to catch your pastor make one mistake or something like that and be like, all right, he's not qualified. He shouldn't be pastor anymore. Vote him off. Kick him out of the church and stuff like that. That's, that's ridiculous. All right, so be wary of becoming hypercritical and also be wary of becoming just indifferent. All right, it's just so detached from your church family that you, one, you don't even see the red flags of a failing minister or even worse, you just don't care. All right, church is just what you go to. Church is just what you know because your parents brought you there all the time and it's just like, that way I can tell people I'm a good person because I go to church, and that's about it. All right, so beware of being hypercritical. Beware of being indifferent. All right, so the only picture we're going to talk about today, all right, is that of the steward, all right, and his quality represents faithfulness. So we're going to read the first six verses of chapter 4. All right, so let's look at that. Verse 1 says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet I am not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, 
who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sake. All right, so that's the main people that they seem to struggle with. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. That you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. All right, don't let it become a pride issue. Don't let it become, I'm better than you because I follow Paul, or I'm better than you because I follow Apollos. All right, so Paul, Apollos, Peter, it doesn't matter who they are. That's what Peter's trying to, uh, Paul's trying to get across here. It doesn't matter who I am. What does matter is that we are ministers of Christ. We see that in verse 1. Let a man so account of us. If you want to think anything of us, only think this, that as of the ministers of Christ, that we are ministers for God. All right, does anybody know what the word minister means? Yes. Um, so it's just someone who serves and helps others? All right, that's, that's pretty good. All right, anybody else? There's more than one definition. Uh, one term, or for, yes. One who teaches. One who teaches, okay. Here's actually where the idea of what a minister, it's, it's part of a definition of minister, but it also gives us the idea of how a minister is supposed to act. All right, and that is a minister is an under rower. All right, now thinking Paul is, is also a Roman citizen as well as a Jewish citizen. Thinking in Roman history, what is an under rower? Do you think, Josiah? Would it be like on their ships, the men who would be below deck rowing and propelling the ship? Yes, the men who are below deck rowing and propelling the, sh the ship. Who are the people that usually are below deck rowing and propelling the ship? The mark. Oh, like slaves. Slaves. All right, and here's the picture he's trying to get across. Don't think anything of us. We are just ministers of Christ. We're just the under rowers, all right? The people, the slaves under the boat that are just propelling it forward, all right? Is any slave greater than another slave in that instance? No. Paul's saying, hey, I'm not any better than Apollos. Apollos is not any better than me, all right? Anybody in our society today that is ministering for Christ... None of us are better than someone else, even if one person has a bigger church than the other person, because in reality, they are all just servants of God. Who is their master? Our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Lord means, master. All right, so it's not about me. It's not about me being greater than you. It's just about God. It's like we're under rowers. No slave, no servant is greater than another. We're not captains of the ship. We're just propelling it forward. All right, but we see the word steward as well. All right, what is a steward? Anybody know? All right, this one might be Joanna. An overseer. An overseer, that's pretty good. Anything else that a steward does? Um, they take care of whatever has been loaned to them. Yes, loaned. That, that, that's pretty good. I will go with that. A servant is, uh, a steward is a servant who manages everything for his master. All right, whether his master be away or his master's there, he is managing what his master has. And as Grace kind of alluded to there, he owns nothing. He may be in charge of this great estate because he's his master's steward, all right, but he doesn't own the estate. A great picture of this that we see in the Bible is Joseph in, in the book of Genesis. All right, who is Joseph a steward for? Gage. Potiphar. Potiphar. All right, when he was sold into slavery by his, his good old brothers there and stuff, <laughs> and he gets to Egypt, he gets into Potiphar's house, he doesn't pout and complain, but he actually works diligently and he gets ushered up into the position of the main steward of the house, and he even tells Potiphar's wife, like, hey, your husband has given me charge over everything in this house except for you. It shows how great of a steward he was, but he didn't own anything in Potiphar's house. He actually had the power to do this and that and to manage these things, but at the end of the day, who, whose house does it belong to? Potiphar. All right? And as Christians, if you know Christ as your Savior, if you're a believer, you are to be stewards for God. Everything you have is given to you by God. You know, every good and perfect gift, as the Bible says, coming down from the Father of lights. It's not ours, but we are to steward it to God's glory. All right? Our grades, our jobs, our, our estates, our money, whatever we have in the future, we should be aware of, hey, how am I utilizing this? Am I using this to the glory of God? The church, bring it back to ministers in the church, the church is the household of faith. And the ministers are stewards who share God's wealth and wisdom with the family. All right? So the main thing, the main responsibility of a minister or a pastor is to be faithful to his master. 
The main responsibility of a steward is to be faithful to his master. Go back to the, the, the thought of the under rower. All right? No slave is better than any, any other slave while they're rowing that boat. All right? It makes no sense at all for one guy who has his oar to be like, I'm going to show my master I'm so much better and start trying to like row faster than everyone else. Why is that not going to work? Either. <laughs> the boat will start going in circles. It'll go in a circle. It'll look like idiots, you know? And it's like, it doesn't make any sense. No, and the master is not going to care about that. In fact, he's going to be infuriated by that. You're not being faithful to the task. All right? It's not about being greater than anybody else in the church family. It's not about being greater than any other minister. It's about being faithful to the master. All right? Um, it's not about, you know, am I a better speaker than Paul? It's not about, do I have more followers than Apollos? Today, in your, your guys' situation, some of you guys are already starting to help out in nurseries. Some of you guys are starting to help out in different things in the church. That's awesome. It's not about... Um, I know how to run the sound booth better than, than so-and-so. It's not like, it's not about, oh, I'm, a, I'm the one that's like the baby whisperer and they all start crying when I hold them or something like that. No, it's just about being faithful to Christ, all right? And that's the question. When it comes to any minister, any pastor you see, is he about himself? Is he about being better than the church down the street? Or is he about being faithful to Christ, all right? A steward must be found faithful. All right, we're going to go into our next section here. Because we see in the rest of our passage, it talks about judging a lot. Alright, so that's our next point. So judgmental. So judgy. Alright, there will always be criticism. Alright, but which one should we heed? Right? Anyone that's seeking to serve God, a pastor that's seeking to serve God in the church, a, a, a layman who's trying to see, uh, find ways to serve God as a just a regular Joe in the church as well, being a volunteer whatsoever that may be, there's always going to be people that will judge what you do. But whose judgment should you heed? And we see three different types of judgment here. Look at verse 3. It says, but with me, so this is Paul speaking, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. So Paul's saying, like, I don't care if you guys have anything bad to say about me. I don't care if you guys are saying, like, oh, Paul's is so much better than Paul in this way. So the first judgment we see is man's judgment. Okay? This is the one that, I'm going to be aware of saying this because there's still uh, ways that this is okay. But what Paul is getting across here is that it bears little weight to him what the rest of these people in the church of Corinth are saying about him compared to Apollos because his master's judgment is what is most important. That's the main thing. The master's judgment, God's judgment, is far more important than what any man's going to say. Um, Paul did not get upset when people criticized him because he knew that he was faithful to God. All right? He cared much more if God was to show him that, hey, Paul, you've gone off track. Paul, you've been unfaithful to me. You've been starting to think about your own clout instead of thinking about how to spread my gospel. We go on in verse 3. We're going to see the second judgment here. It says, but with me is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. Okay, so man's judgment. I don't care what you guys say about me. Or of man's judgment, yea, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself. Okay, so the, the next type of judgment he's talking about, first is man's judgment, but now he's talking about self, so we're talking about self-judgment. Now this could be beneficial or disastrous. All right? The same thing could be said about uh, man's judgment as well. Okay, If you're just seeking to please people, then be wary of always giving heed to man's judgment. Because you, first and foremost, want to please God. But if a loving brother or sister in Christ comes alongside and says, Locke, hey, I've been noticing, you know, you've been doing this, or you've been kind of talking like this lately, is everything okay, is there anything going on? That, that's a good time to heed man's judgment. When a loving brother or sister in Christ is coming to you, like that Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, that iron, that sharpens iron, that's a good type of thing. Same thing with self-judgment. So somebody tell me, how can self-judgment... Me evaluating myself, how can it be both beneficial or disastrous? Grace. It can be disastrous because then you get to the point where you're just you're just essentially just tearing yourself down. Yeah, you're just very self-deprecating and so forth. Uh lot. A way it could be helpful is that you can make you more observant observant about your own behaviors. Yeah, it can help you it can help you grow as well. Um all right, let's talk about this first. Sometimes we just don't know ourselves. 
Alright, Jeremiah tw uh, 17 verse 9 says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked who can know it. Sometimes we just don't know ourselves. Okay? We may think we know one thing, but ultimately our heart's yearning towards something else. So, and this could lead to like self-righteousness, like, hey, hey, I got it all together. Or it could lead to ignorance, like you don't realize what you're missing or what you're about to walk into. Even when we give ourselves an honest assessment, okay, I'm stepping back, and I've seen that, you know what, I do struggle in this. Man, I can't believe I said that again. Man, I can't believe I handled that situation that way. And that's an honest assessment. We realize we did something wrong there. Even that can result in either growth, all right, I'm going to do better in the future, or it could result in resignation. Why, we, why even try? Why am I even going to give this a try? And we're actually going to get a little bit into what to do about that on Sunday in our Real Christianity series. But understand, God does not want you to just throw in the towel. But you do need to understand that you're, it's not about doing it in your own strength. It's about doing it by the grace of God. All right, all right, so we have man's judgment, we have self-judgment. Our last one, look at verse 4 again. Uh, For I know nothing by myself, yet I am, am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, for no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So, if we have man's judgment, self-judgment, what's the last judgment we're probably getting out of here? Micah. God's judgment. God's judgment. Very good. All right, God's judgment. This is the one we should take heed of. Now, God can use several different things to help us understand, whoa, I need to correct something, especially when we're trying to minister for Him. He can use the Word. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 talks about the Bible is sharper than any, what? Two-edged Two sword. You know, dividing to even asunder. All these things about how it gets to the intent of the heart. All right, It reveals, the Bible also says how it's like a mirror that you look into and you see, oh man, I got spinach in my teeth. That's something I need to take care of. All right? He uses God's word. He uses the spirit, the ministry of the spirit. It will guide you in all truth. And then obviously a loving friend. We already alluded to that already. But the main reference here, and we see in verse 5 and 6, six is actually to the judgment seat of Christ. Ultimately, man, your work that you do for God will be judged before God at the judgment seat of Christ, after uh, the, the, the rapture and so forth. And, that, and we don't have time to get into this uh, in this class. Maybe we'll do a, a Revelation study sometime in the future. But... When I say the judgment seat of Christ, that is different from the great white throne judgment. All right, the great white throne judgment that we see in the Bible at the end times, that deals with those who have rejected Christ and their final judgment. The judgment seat of Christ is apart from that, all right, for those that have been raptured up his church into heaven, and they will be judged of their works that they did for Christ as believers on earth. Okay? They don't lose their salvation. They don't lose anything, but they are judged. Were you faithful? And that's the main thing a steward needs to be. Were you faithful to Christ? Were you laying up those good works for Him? You're still saved, but were you being? You will be judged by your faithfulness. Okay. All right. So we have man judgment, God's ju uh, self judgment, God's judgment. We're gonna end on this. Okay. All these things. God's judgment's the most important, right? Okay. But understanding that, what is a retort people then give that hey, God's judgment is the most important? All right, I'm going to ask the second row ladies here, because right, you guys love to raise your hand. All right, When people understand, hey, God's judgment is the most important thing, what can that lead to then when people confront you or these people about, hey, I know you've been doing this, you probably shouldn't do that. What would be a retort someone would give that's not the best thing to give? Because, like, hey, God's judgment is the most important. What kind of attitude comes then when people don't want to be judged? They say what? Only who can what? Only God can judge. Only God can judge. Alana, what did they say? Oh Thank you. All right, so they're like, only God, yeah, you can't judge me. Only God can judge me. And they take that, uh, some passages out of Matthew, out of context when it comes to that. All right, but we need to be wary of critical immunity. All right, just understanding this concept that God's judgment is the one we need to heed the most. Are we being faithful to him? Does not mean that we are immune to any sort of criticism that comes our way, especially when it's justified. All right, if... 
Micaiah is teaching a Sunday school class and he's teaching heresy. Boy. It is right for someone to confront Micaiah about his heresy. All right? They, he, and Micaiah can't be like, hey, only God, God will judge you. All right? But I want you to take care of this now. All right? Understand that. And that's the greatest thing about when people say stuff like, you know, hey, only God can judge me. He will. Okay? All right, so critical immunity. Only God can judge me. All right, let's get to this. The local church, one of the pictures we see is a family. All right, now, everybody look up here. This example I'm going to give. All right, I don't want any jokes or anything like that. Understand, I know in society today, families aren't perfect. All right, people have their problems. People have their conflicts. And people have their broken homes. All right? But understand this picture, when it pertains to God, God's family is always going to be God's ideal. It's a perfect thing. Okay? And the local church is a family. And members of a family help each other grow. Okay? Even the siblings, they help the younger siblings. They help guide them. They help direct them. Hey, don't touch that. Don't stick your finger in there. Okay? Stuff like that. Your parents are supposed to be parents, rearing and instructing their kids in certain ways. Okay? When it comes to a family and when you guys someday become parents, understand that. Be a parent. Don't just be like, oh, I'm going to let my kid discover for themselves whether or not it's good to stick their finger in the electrical socket. So, no, no. Be a parent and tell them no. Yeah, it might mean you have to smack their hand and, and, and you know, give them that, that sense of, hey, there are consequences if you do something wrong. But that's the duty of a parent. All right? Be a loving brother or sister to your siblings. All right? Don't make them, don't allow them to go in error. No, correct them. And as the Bible says, we are to speak the truth in love. Let's try it again. We are to speak the truth in love. So the local church is a family. Members of a family want to help one another grow. So guys, there are going to be times when criticism is necessary. Iron sharpeneth iron. A loving brother is saying, hey, I see you going down this way, and I, it's, I don't think it's going to lead anywhere that you want to go. That is judgment that you can heed because that is coming from a godly source. All right? Uh, when I was in school, Miss Christine could tell you about this too, in, in Pensacola, you learned about, they always gave this lecture at the beginning of the school year because Pensacola is known for their white beaches, all right? And they know the students are going to want to, hey, as soon as I get that first weekend and I'm done with classes, I'm going to go, and, and here's the funny thing, like, I'm going to go to study at the beach. They're not studying at the beach, all right? They bring their books and they leave them in the sand and whatever. And they're like, I'm going to go to the beach. So they give this lecture at the beginning of every semester, because they know this is going to happen, and they explain what these flags mean. Like flags? Yes, at the beach, you guys go to any beach, really. They have flags that they fly on the beaches to say, hey, there's certain things that are out there. Different color flags mean different color things. Hey, there's, there's a lot of riptides right now, or there's a lot of, uh, you know, different sea creatures that are really close to the shore, or shark warnings, or whatever it may be. And they go over, hey, these are what the flags mean, these are the sites you can go to, you can check before you go to the beach, whenever you want to go, that, hey, this is what you can expect. High tide, rough waters, anything. Okay? How many of you guys have ever heard the term, like, hey, you got to watch out for those red flags? Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. you got to watch out for those red flags. <laughs> Alright, and if you see red flags in one of your brother or sister's uh, in Christ's lives, okay, you want to warn them, hey, watch out for that red flag. Or maybe, you know, because there's all these different colors. When it comes to the beach, you might have to explain, hey, this is what that flag means. Maybe you haven't seen it. Maybe you're not acknowledging it yet because you don't understand what it means. But hey, this is what this color flag means. Just be wary of that. Watch out for that. And that's a good godly thing to heed. All right? See the flags. Explain what the flags mean. But if you are to judge at all, so we've been talking about a lot if somebody is giving you the criticism, telling you what you need to get right. If you're the one that's trying to tell someone or warn someone or, in essence, judge somebody, make sure you're using the right standard, okay? So if I was like, we all know what this is. What is this? It's a yardstick, not a meter stick. All right. All right. So if we're going to go around and we're going to use this to measure thing, is it going to make sense for me to be like, Micaiah, come up here. All right. Can you tell me how many centimeters long is my, uh, my pulpit, uh, wide is my pulpit? Can you tell me? About 60. Are you sure? How do you know it's, it's 60 centimeters long? Can you tell exactly? No. Why not? Because there are centimeters long. Yeah. All right. 
inches. No, that's good. Um, yeah, it's inches. It's not centimeters. All right, you're not going to break out a rule that only has inches on it and try to measure something in centimeters. The rest of the world will, but not in America, okay? Um, but you want to use the right standard. And when the Bible talks about a uh, standard or meter like that, it's talking about a, a, a unit of measurement, okay? You want to use the right standard so you have a consistent outcome, okay? If you're using your wisdom, your judgment to judge another man and tell him, hey, you're not being a good Christian because you're not doing this, you're not being a good minister for Christ because you're not doing it this way, you're... Your judgment means nothing. And you could be like Paul at the beginning of this chapter. is like, hey, what you judge of me, I could care less about. I mean, maybe I could care less about it. I don't care. But if you're using God's standard, if you're using the right judgment, so on the other side, you have seven years there, then you can give a right judgment, and that is something somebody should heed, but you still give the truth in love. Oh, wow, guys. But you still give the truth in <coughs> love. love. Very good. All right, any questions? Yes, Ethan. So if you do use God's standard to judge correctly, and they do respond with, only God can judge me, how do you respond back? Oh, okay, well, at those moments, that's actually a... Matthew chapter 18, that's a good one to go to for that. We might do a lesson on that in the future. But for practical reasons, uh, you want to keep yourself as well from erring. What I mean by that is you want to keep yourself from also falling into sin. And the tendency then is if somebody approaches someone and they're just being hard-headed and they're like, but you can't tell me what's the only God and you're like, but yeah, but this is what God word says and they're just still being like belligerent and hard-headed about it. You leave them. Because here's the thing, Ethan, is it, about winning the, is it about winning that conversation with them? No. No. And that's the thing. You're not about winning the conversation. You're giving them the truth in love and if you see that continuing that conversation is going to start making you act in a way that is not in the love of Christ, you got to step away. You gave them the truth, and that's between them and God what they want to do with the truth. You're not God. All right? And so the best thing to do is, hey, I'm going to keep myself from getting to a place where I too will react in a sinful manner.